Dear friends and followers, welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be looking at the question, why size matters in aviation. They're becoming a rare sight. The Boeing 737-100s and 200s, Boeing's first generation of the 737 known as the Originals, famous for the unusually long and slim engines directly mounted under the wings, the 737-100 and the slightly longer 737-200 paved the way for Boeing's most successful aircraft family. Upcoming 737 generations received numerous upgrades, including bigger engines, which were just too big to fit under the wing anymore. So therefore, 737-300s and its successors had their engines mounted in front of the wing. And it's not just the 737 that received larger engines, the mothership, the 747, also increased her engine size over the years. Now this trend can clearly be seen in all generations of all types of airplanes, which leads us to the question, why do jet engines become bigger and bigger and are there any limitations to their size? We're gonna scale it up and let's get started. Jet Blue 89, Kennedy Ground, runway. Before we start, we have to take a short look on the physics behind the jet engine, also known as the turbojet of older commercial airliners. Now there is a more detailed video on how a modern turbofan jet engine works right here. So the simplest form of a turbojet is made up of four parts. An intake, including a compressor, the combustion chamber, a turbine, and a nozzle. As long as the engine is running, meaning as long as there is a supply of fuel, the compressor is spinning, sucking air into the engine where it gets compressed as it passes rotor and stator blades. Then the hot and pressurized air gets mixed with fuel and is burned in the combustion chamber. The expanding and accelerated hot air then passes through the turbine which is made up of rotary blades, which are mounted on the same shaft as the rotors of the compressor at the front of the engine, or as you know it, the fan, and is finally blown out of the nozzle at a higher velocity than it was taken in by the fan, resulting in a force that continuously wants to push the aircraft forward. Very simply speaking, suck, squeeze, bang, blow which pretty much breaks it down to the essence of how it works. So in order to increase our force, which in our case is our thrust output, we must either increase the exhaust velocity or we have to get more air through the engine at the same time. Keeping that in mind, let's have a look at commercial jet engines. Now this type of engine is called a turbofan engine. Now turbo, because the entering air is being compressed, and turbo fan, obviously because of the huge fan at the front of the engine, which primarily accelerates the sucked in air, and secondly, to compress parts of it too. It works just like the turbojet, but now has an additional fan, a second compressor, and a second turbine. Now besides that, we now have two channels through which the air can pass through. The inner channel, called the core, which is basically going through the actual engine, and an outer channel between the core and the engine's casing, which is called the bypass. Now the ratio between the amount of air passing through the bypass and the amount of air passing through the core is called the bypass ratio. But more about that in a minute. Now the principle of suck, squeeze, bang and blow stays the same with the difference that the air is now sucked in by the fan and is split up into those two channels. Now the bypassed air is simply accelerated air by the fan and guided around the core to be blown out at the end. The inner channel, on the other hand, leads the air through the low pressure and high pressure compressor and then into the combustion chamber where the compressed air is mixed with fuel and then ignited. Now the pressurized and hot air then expands and accelerates over the high pressure turbine, which in return drives the high pressure compressor at the front of the engine. 
and it also passes through the low pressure turbine which drives the low pressure compressor and the fan. And after that, the air is blown out of the engine exhaust. In modern turbine fan engines, over 80% of the thrust is solely provided by the bypass. How is that possible, you might think? How can a fan that just pushes cold air around the actual engine provide far more thrust than a high-tech mix of compressors and turbines that burns fuel and air at temperatures that are sometimes even higher than the melting points of the components itself? Well, the answer is simple, the bypass ratio. Now remember, to increase thrust, we can either accelerate our air faster or put more air through the whole thing. Now trying to increase the exhaust velocity will at one point lead us to some military use solutions such as the afterburners, but these technologies are sadly inefficient, although they look fantastic, hence Concorde. Now instead, we rather try to put more air through the engine. And the turbofan does exactly that. For that purpose, we need much larger intakes, and as technology strives further, the fans get larger and larger, and therefore the engine size increases. And engine manufacturers are constantly trying to increase efficiency and reaching higher bypass ratios by using modern manufacturing techniques and materials. It is also worth mentioning that besides providing most of the thrust, the bypass obviously surrounds the core with relatively cool air, which has a cooling effect reduces engine noise and increases its efficiency. Now let's take a step back into reality and to get a little bit out of the world of physics, let me show you some numbers. The engine of a 737-200, as shown in the beginning of this video, has a fan with a diameter of about 1.2 meters. And it has a bypass ratio of 1.7 to 1, meaning 1.7 times of the air has bypassed around the engine compared to that that went through it. It has an overall mass flow of 225 kilograms of air per second. Now that sounds like much in the first place, but wait for the next engine. <laughs> The General Electric 90, which powers the current 777 models, has a fan diameter of 3.2 meters and a bypass ratio of 9 to 1. At takeoff, it pushes 1,300 kilograms of air per second around the bypass. Let me say that again, per second. Count to 1 and the air with a massive equivalent to an average compact car has passed through that engine. And yes, the 777 has two of them. The next big deal to come is the General Electric 9X, built for the next generation of the 777X. Now by now, it is the biggest turbofan engine ever made. It has a fan diameter of 3.4 meters and is therefore, with its engine casing, wider than a 737 fuselage. Take that in for a minute. In addition to that, it has a bypass ratio of 10.1 to 1 and therefore pushes its efficiency even further. If you think about it, a turbofan jet airliner, very basically speaking, is a propeller-driven plane. Think about that. Side question. Comment below the most famous turbojet aircraft, not turbofan, to have ever existed. I'm excited to see your comments. Now that we have seen why the engine size increased over time, the question arises. Are there any limitations to the size of the turbofan engine? Uh, sure, you might think it has to fit under the wing at least. Well, that's not wrong. Ground clearance is definitely an important point. But let's imagine we wouldn't worry about that and we could keep increasing the size and the engine's efficiency repeatedly. So bigger fan, more bypassed air and more thrust. Well, not quite. Imagine two race cars going in a straight line at the same speed. Suddenly, they're coming towards a turn. Now, they both maintain the exact same speed, but the car on the inner lane of the turn will automatically end up overtaking the car on the outer lane. And that's because the inner car has a greater angular velocity than the outer one. To prevent itself from being passed by, the outer car must increase its speed to reach the same angular velocity as the inner car. 
And the same goes for the fan blades. While having the same angular velocity, the fan blade tip turns much faster than the root of the blade because of its greater distance to the shaft. Now by increasing the engine size, you increase the diameter of the fan, which puts the fan blade tips even further away. Now the low pressure compressor, as well as every other turning component in the engine reaches its maximum efficiency at a specific RPM. Now because the low pressure compressor sits on the same shaft as the fan, the RPM, which may suit the compressor best, can lead to supersonic speeds at the fan blade tips. And that's not what you want. Propellers or fans have the characteristic that their efficiency decreases when they're spun too fast. Therefore, the Pratt & Whitney 1000G engine family, powering, for example, the A320neo, are so-called geared turbo fans. Now, instead of attaching the low pressure compressor and the fan to the same shaft, a gearbox between the fan and the compressor is used to lower the fan RPM, assuring that both the fan and the compressor can work at their most suitable RPM, which decreases fuel burn and increases the efficiency a lot. It's the sweet balance that make modern jet engines so efficient. I have to say, being a jet engine engineer for either Rolls-Royce, Pratt & Whitney or General Electric must be an incredible job, trying to constantly push the physical boundaries, but trying to keep it efficient and safe at the same time must be their drive to go to work every day. Ladies and gents, I highly respect your work. That's it today, I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to check out my other video with more detailed information on how a jet engine works. And here's your checklist for today. Subscribe to my channel, check. Activate the notification bell, check. Follow my Instagram account, check. Perform a touch and go at my website, check. And don't forget, a good pilot is always learning. Wishing you all the best, your Captain Joe. Thank you.